last time we were discussing about the application of immobilized enzymes and we had mentioned that the enzymes find applications in a variety of situations and we dealt with the application of enzy immobilized enzymes as industrial biocatalyst in process industries. And uh, as I mentioned also that two major sectors of application of immobilized enzymes are analytical applications and also their application uh, in the therapeutics for the treatment of diseases in human beings and both the applications are also particularly important or in contrast to the application as industrial catalyst lies in the fact that you require much more uh, purified systems and the use of high value enzymes uh, in their application. Unlike in the case of industrial biocatalyst where mostly we were dealing with relatively uh, lesser valued enzymes and the two applications on analytical applications and therapeutics require relatively high value enzymes and in a higher purified state. Now just to take up the analytical applications, uh, the variety of applications that have been reported they can be classified into four different types. The first is automated analysis procedures by combining immobilized enzymes with various analytical tools. Now we come across a variety of analytical situations whether in, in the area of research or even in the area of uh, clinical analysis where the samples are analyzed in large numbers and uh, be required to use uh, very specific uh, reactions that can be catalyzed by enzymes. Of course, one way is as you must have done in your uh, laboratory class the use of glucose oxidase for example for assay of glucose. Now, the use of soluble enzyme may be fine enough if you have to analyze let us say couple of samples 3 or 4, but in situations where the uh, samples to be analyzed are in very large number and very often such instances are uh, met in clinical hosp in hospitals in clinical laboratories where hundreds or few hundreds of samples every day are encountered and uh, use of uh, soluble enzyme may be sometimes uh, sort of uneconomical. Similarly, in research also I mean a candidate a student might be analyzing the similar sample hundreds of them uh, over a day and just to get his results. So, in those cases uh, the analytical procedures can be automated by combining the immobilized enzymes in instead of soluble enzyme with a standard analytical device. It could be a spectrophotometer, it could be a fluoro spectrophotometer, it could be a pH meter I mean as simple as pH meter. So, any uh, analytical simple analytical tool can be combined and used uh, with uh, the now a very simple example of this uh, approach was reported by Hicks and Updike way back in 66 almost in the earliest and another point I think I like to uh, illustrate that incidentally the bulk of the analytical applications were the earliest uses of uh, immobilized enzyme. In fact, the, their application in uh, process industry was adopted much later than they were used in analytical applications and obviously th that means basically uh, the, the cost uh, implications are much more severe in analytical uh, section and you see the setup is like this that a, a sample the, a, a, a given sample in which the a species a chemical species has to be analyzed is passed through a immobilized enzyme column a very small ca column and here in the, in the from this reference it was a uh, a glucose or a lactic acid det, uh, I mean uh, determination based on glucose oxidase or lactate dehydrogenase and they were immobilized on polyacrylamide gel and packed into a column in a very small column and the substrate was fed at 0.8 ml per minute and then this is passed uh, through a, a tubing and uh, through a delay line. So, that you provide the reaction time and a color reagent is added here and after that in a spectrophotometer a photometric cell uh, which is connected to the system uh, the reaction passes and the color developed is monitored. You can also have uh, some standard solutions and this is a two way valve whereby you can either put a standard solution and measure your absorbance in the photometer 
or you can put the actual cell. And of course, on the other side, you have a buffer or a control solution which also passes through a delay line and the same photometer uh, uh, at the same wavelength, of course, a different photometer, the same wavelength. And of course, to empty the photometer tube, a pulsers are used so that in a pulse mode, the tubes are filled and emptied. While the flow is continuous, but the photometer measures uh, in a pulse mode and the material are removed, and, and that way, uh, in fact, uh, two of the systems which were very early reported was glucose by glucose oxidase and uh, lactic acid by uh, lactate dehydrogenase. Then you know the kind of reaction that take place in the uh, uh, immobilized enzyme column, lactic acid uh, in the presence of NAD of course, the lactic acid is uh, the sample itself is mixed with NAD solution and pyruvic acid is formed with a reduced NAD and reduced NAD is then oxidized with a uh, dye. DPI and uh, then uh, it gets the NAD gets regenerated that means gets oxidized and the reduced dye is colorless. This DPI is blue and this colorless so difference in the absorbance uh, is related to the uh, concentration of the lactic acid. On the other hand in the case of glucose it is glucose to gluconic acid plus hydrogen peroxide and hydrogen peroxide again acts as the oxidizing agent and it uh, oxidizes uh, to the DPI to a color a color product which is blue in color and is measured and uh, essentially uh, in large no other number of dyes also have been reported and this dye is only uh, just to uh, facilitate the measurement of uh, the color now two other very interesting examples were also came in almost during the same time in 64 and 65 Rizal and kachaski in israel they reported the use of urease immobilized on diastized amino acid copolymer used for the determination of urea in urine or serum and also for the removal of urea from body fluids. Now, essentially this urea system uh, in urine samples is used today in many hospital large hospitals on a commercial scale and where the requirement is almost 1000 samples in a day. So, instead of employing a, I mean a number of clinical I mean a analysts uh, they have a auto uh, I mean um, analyzer in which uh, the immobilized column uh, can carry out the job and almost 1000 samples can be analyzed using a sim simple single cartridge of immobilized enzyme and the cost can be saved effectively. The other is Gilmo and Kramer we also reported in 65 they did for cholinesterase which was entrapped in a starch matrix and was used for continuous detection of anti cholinesterase. Now, here is an example uh, not really of a metabolite or uh, I mean some kind of a uh, substrate or a product, but uh, it was just like a environmental analysis where the presence of certain uh, I mean uh, cholinesterase inhibitors present in either effluents or in air as a result of pollution were monitored continuously in a I mean using a, a immobilized enzyme immobilized cholinesterase and trapped in a starch matrix plus a fluorescent spectrophotometer because uh, the product ultimately uh, I mean gives a fluorescence and the change in fluorescence as a result of inhibitor present that means the fluorescence decreases and by that one can monitor continuously the uh, I mean and the, the measurement of fluorescence uh, gives you a direct indication of the concentration of inhibitor in the feed stream. The second uh, class of uh, analytical applications are immobilized or em enzyme electrodes. Of course, uh, although I have listed it second, but I think it has become commercially a very, very important sector of analytical tool. Now, what, a, what is a essentially an enzyme electrode or very general we call it a biosensor as an analytical device. Essentially, I mean it is a, a very a crude definition could include uh, it as a hybrid device where a biological recognition molecule or a cell or a cell component is integrated with a physical or chemical detector we know as transducer to utilize the selective analysis of a biochemical species in a sample. So, basically uh, there you must notice that there are three distinct uh, uh, sort of segments one is a biological unit which and which is integrated with a transducer and the third is your annihilate. Now, these three systems the biological unit transducer and the annihilate have to have a linkage that means this annihilate must be able to recognize this biological unit 
there must be an affinity between the two and secondly uh, the substrate or the product of the reaction which comes out as a result of uh, this interaction must be able to generate a measurable uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, measurable uh, I mean unit or measurable uh, parameter which can be measured by the transducer in quantitative terms. So, that it can be related with either the substrate concentration or some species in the sample. So, what is the mileage? Analyte means the chemical species which is to be analyzed. Say for example, you want in, in let us say in the blood you want to analyze sugar, so glucose. So, glucose is the analyte, the, uh, the chemical species which need to be analyzed. So, in, in other words, uh, the, the concept is very simple and a large variety of biological units have been used to prepare biosensors. Of course, uh, as far as we are concerned, we will be stressing more on enzymes as a biological unit, but other than enzymes, you can also use microbial cells, plant cells, animal cells, uh, cell membranes, lactins or antibodies, of course, depending upon the analyte. The purpose is that uh, the, the, the molecule to be analyzed, the chemical species to be analyzed must recognize, must have a specific recognition for the biological unit. And of course, the type of transducers that are used, very commonly used are amperometric or potentiometric electrodes. And the recent year developments have been in the area of field effect transistors, thermistors as well. But uh, still on commercial level, amperometric and potentiometric uh, transducers are the common uh, tools that are used uh, in bulk. Sir, could you just explain why, what is the role of a mine? The role of a? Annihilate. No, annihilate is essentially the species, chemical species which is to be monitored in the sample. Say for example, if you want to monitor urea in urine sample, urea is an annihilate. Urine is a sample, the fluid to be analyzed and uh, the biological unit which is uh, recognizing that annihilate is the uh, material either an enzyme or a cell which has a some affinity for that uh, molecule and you need a physical uh, transducer uh, which can uh, sense either the substrate or the product or any other I mean signal which is generated through the reaction. Excuse me, sir. So, how are they linked? I will come to that. Just again to I mean illustrate uh, schematically uh, the same concept of a biosensor. Now, you have I have just taken here a substrate as a, a, a molecule to be analyzed in any given system. You have an immobilized enzyme, this is a mobilized enzyme. Now, this is uh, the substrate molecule recognizes the enzyme species present on the immobilized enzyme. It generates obviously now there, there, there can be a kind of a, a sort of a membrane through which the product or any other species which comes out as a result of reaction passes through and approaches a, a transducer, I mean an analytical device and which generates a signal which can be monitored. Now, it can be in the form of a current, it can be in the form of a potential difference, it can be in the form of temperature change, I mean a variety of uh, I mean uh, signals can be generated and that depends on the uh, type of uh, electrode we are producing. Now, the basic concept is that choose an appropriate combination of biological and transducing elements. That means, choose a biological agents in we are uh, emphasizing on immobilized enzymes which will recognize the annihilate. Secondly, convert the recognition process into a physicochemical change either current, voltage, temperature which either directly or indirectly generates the current. Uh, uh, into a physical chemical change which either directly or indirectly generates the current and of course, I mean in the electrical circuit current is a very easily measurable uh, parameter and of course, uh, just to make it a uh, I mean repeat uh, use suitable for repeated use uh, we need to immobilize the bio element. Theoretically, the system can also be used in a soluble form also, but uh, just to make it a, a continuously usable system uh, the bio element is immobilized. Now, what kind of electrodes you usually are used? Now, basically what we use uh, say take for example, your pH electrode in a laboratory. Now, pH electrode is a transducer, one of the transducers which can be used in the case of an enzyme electrode. What you need to simply do is at the tip of the electrode, you need to insert by some mechanism an immobilized enzyme uh, layer at the tip. So, that when you dip that uh, electrode into a sample liquid 
the sample comes in contact with the immobilized enzyme layer used in the form of thin film and the reaction takes place the product uh, goes through and it it is sensed by the uh, the ph electrode and uh, and ph electrode essentially is a potentiometric uh, transducer it is generates uh, i mean uh, i mean the potential and that potential is measured and of course uh, i mean uh, calibrated in the form of ph change and, uh, and that can be used simply similarly a number of ion selective electrodes which also function on the same principle of potentiometric transducer can be used as transducing element now the now in the case of just as a principle the enzyme is bound to an ion selective electrode that will detect the presence of a substrate or product that means uh, if the substrate is let us say ionizable it can measure that or it can measure a product of the enzyme catalyzed reaction the transducer measures the potential difference between a reference and a sensing electrode basically uh, i mean the we are not doing any manipulation with the sensor the transducer we use as it is the readily available commercially available transducer it could be a do electrode what you use in a fermentation in a fermenter for measurement of dissolved oxygen because that is amperometric transducer essentially it measures current on the other hand a simple ph meter or a ammonium ion electrode or a carbon dioxide electrode they are potentiometric uh, transducers on the No, that mechanism can be developed, but essentially it should be in proximity with the electrode. That means at the tip, it should be next to the sensing site of the electrode. I will illustrate you the how do we do that. Uh, but uh, it, the principle, basic principle is that it should be in the proximity of the sensing site of the transducer. Now, how do you do it? There are, I mean, there are ways and means. I mean, one can manipulate and develop number of strategies. Like a amperometric uh, Clark type dissolved oxygen electrode, what you use in the case of uh, a, your a fermentation fluids for measurement of dissolved oxygen, they are based essentially on platinum cathode and a silver anode, which is immersed in saturated KCl, which is separated from the test solution by a PTFE membrane. That means at the tip of the transducer, you have a PTFE membrane so that the sample which in which the analysis has to be done for dissolved oxygen is separated from your KCL solution because this should not get mixed and a potential of about 0.5 to 0.8 volts a constant value is applied because this uh, temperature this uh, voltage applied uh, will be uh, will determine the calibration of the uh, the current which is generated as a result of dissolved oxygen when it comes in contact with the uh, uh, with the uh, electrode the potential of 0.5 to 0.8 volt is usually applied across the electrode and the current generated is proportional to the concentration of the substrate in the sample. Now, essentially the, the current generated essentially is reflected by dissolved oxygen concentration because uh, on the cathode it is the oxygen which essentially uh, I mean uh, takes up the protons generated as a result of uh, I mean uh, an, uh, result of the uh, proton generated on the anode. So, basically it is dissolved oxygen, but essentially this dissolved oxygen is a function or is a parameter which is participating in the reaction. So, any reaction, enzymatic reaction which or and usually there will be oxidoreductases, redox reactions, if they consume oxygen or give out oxygen, a difference in the dissolved oxygen can be used to measure uh, the substrate. For, for example, to, to essentially yes, the electrode is measuring dissolved oxygen but the consumption of dissolved oxygen in the fluid is a result of enzymatic reaction like for example you take glucose now glucose plus oxygen will give you gluconic acid and and in the sample the when you bring the glucose sample in a proximity of the electrode uh, which which has also the glucose oxidizer enzyme and i mean sort of deposited on it the enzyme will react with the glucose in the presence of oxygen and consume oxygen now there will be a fall in the oxygen concentration, dissolved oxygen concentration, which will be monitored by the electrode, and this fall in dissolved oxygen concentration under steady state will be proportional to the substrate concentration. So, why does the immobilized enzyme have to be in proximity to the electrode, even if it is elsewhere? You don't have to just like we had, the, I mean, the immobilized enzyme columns put it under, I mean, in a, just like in the earlier automated devices, you can have a small column and link it to a photometer. That is possible, but again, to use it, I mean, in terms of convenience. I see use of a PS electrode is very simple. You just dip into solution and you get the result output. Whereas, if you have to really set up an auto, auto analyzer, it will have a full flow setup 
and all tubings and you will have a reaction period and all those things and ultimately uh, you end up in a very cumbersome system. A a any analytical device in the form of an electrode physical uh, device uh, which can be easily calibrated in terms of uh, the uh, con concentration of the sample it is much easy to handle. It is only convenience yes you can have either way also you can uh, put the, your enzyme into a column and pass it through a uh, spectrophotometer and that it can be automated no doubt about it. Now, the three parameters which are important in the case of a electrode enzyme electrode are selectivity of course, the selectivity is a function which uh, is uh, I mean offered to it by enzyme because uh, the enzyme has to be chosen which is highly selective for and of course, uh, that choice is important because if you are not able to choose a very selective enzyme the analysis may not be very specific. Then sensitivity, now sensitivity is a function of the uh, km and km value of the enzyme that means, what is the uh, I mean sort of range of analysis which it can perform that will depend on the uh, km value of the enzyme. The third and probably from the operational point of view important is stability because uh, we must be able to use the same enzyme immobilized enzyme coating for a number of samples. So, that it is stable over a long period of time plus reproducible that means, if the uh, I mean of course, a, a single cartridge usually enzyme is immobilized enzyme is supplied in the form of very fine uh, I mean uh, sort of sandwich between a membrane. So, that they can be replaced on the tip and uh, they can be just to show you a picture of a typical uh, uh, enzyme electrode which of course, uh, we used right in our own laboratory it is a dissolved oxygen electrode simple one uh, which showing different components you have a gold cathode silver anode and teflon membrane at the tip uh, that is your uh, I mean the main electrode has a teflon membrane on the tip. Now, now this teflon membrane over which we put another uh, dialysis membrane which separates the immobilized enzyme, en enzyme is immobilized in the form of a thin film. Enzyme can be immobilized in the form of a thin film and particularly in this case the study which uh, I was referring uh, we immobilize enzyme in uh, cellulose acetate membrane and the enzyme is uh, and just to provide it a support it is inserted between a dialysis tube. So, the dialysis tube provides uh, I mean a, a permeable uh, and which is permeable to let us say small sample like glucose a small molecular weight compound like glucose freely and which is put uh, on this teflon membrane which is uh, already present in the dissolved oxygen electrode. And then of course, the other system what you see a sort of a sleeve this sleeve was just to insert the enzyme film or enzyme membrane onto the electrode as a, as a, a rubber sleeve. So, that you insert on the on the tip the enzyme membrane. You see similarly or, or let us say if you see a, a bigger a viewer view now you can have a, say for example, glucose membrane a glucose measurement a, you have an electrode silver anode and a platinum cathode you have a plastic TF a, a, the a plastic membrane which is obviously, which is supposed to protect your uh, anode and cathode from the uh, which separates the fluid from the internal fluid and after that we put an enzyme gel layer. Now, you can have just any mechanism to you can have some kind of a let us say sleeve which holds this layer like in our case we had a rubber sleeve which is a sort of uh, uh, which is uh, covered over the tip of the electrode. So, that the, the layer the, the film remains intact uh, on the electrode and also it is separate because of the dialysis because being inserted in the dialysis bag it is separate also uh, and so right. So, that it is separate from the uh, uh, PTFE membrane also and also it also provides the, uh, the analytical molecule to permeate I mean to permeate. Uh, through it and come in proximity with the enzyme. Say so, the enzyme is in contact with the two anode and cathode is a problem? No, no enzyme, enzyme is not really in direct contact with the anode and cathode. Anode and cathode only come in picture with the uh, either the substrate or the product which is a result of the enzyme reaction. Like for example, here you see in the second stage which is for L amino acid oxidase you have a simple uh, let us say a glass electrode simple glass just like you have pH electrode. Now, 
what they have done essentially, uh, they have put an enzyme solution. What, what they essentially have done, they have taken a ultrafiltration membrane or cellophane membrane or you can say let us say a dialysis bag which is closed at the bottom instead of open from both ends, you fill some solution, even not even a immobilized enzyme and this cellophane bag is just, I mean the electrode is dipped into it and that is what has been done and then this has been supported by O-rings just like we had put a sleeve in the earlier case, now you put O-rings so that the, uh, the, the bag, the dialysis bag which contains the enzyme remains intact in contact with the, uh, I mean in, in proximity of the enzyme and it can be used to, I mean uh, for measurement systems. Sir, are we trying to measure glucose or are we trying to measure dissolved oxygen? We are indirectly measuring glucose via measurement of dissolved oxygen. The, the glu, dissolved oxygen, electrode will measure dissolved oxygen only, it cannot measure glucose directly. But the glucose concentration results into the production of either production or ox, I mean consumption of oxygen as a result of the enzyme reaction and that is the purpose. Now, a large number of enzyme electrodes have been prepared and uh, in fact, uh, I am just listed here which are commercially available actually. Of course, there are many other experimental electrodes which have been made and reported in literature, but for example, glucose is the most commonly used electrode and uh, the immobilization method polyacrylamide gel, oxygen electrode is the electrode used and the concentration range it measures, it can measure is of the order of 10 to power minus 5 to 10 to power minus 4 molar. I like you to see the, uh, the you know. Uh, the uh, sensitivity of the measurement, which is probably much higher than any physical or chemical measurement system at this concentration level uh, 10 to power that is you are, we are talking in the uh, micromolar range. Then urea, again urea is immobilized in polyacrylamide gel and ammonium ion electrode is used, ion selective electrode, a potentiometric uh, electrode and the range is uh, 1 to 10 microns. Micro, micromolar. Then cholesterol, cholesterol oxidase, collagen membrane and oxygen electrode is the measurement device. As I mentioned in, in all reactions which are redox reactions, I mean oxygen electrodes are used and if it is a, I mean sort of uh, uh, any other ion selective uh, measurement is to be done, then the potentiometric electrode. Urea, ultrafiltration membrane, CO2 electrode, an ion selective electrode again a then penicillin measurement using an enzyme penicillin A which hydrolyzes penicillin using a glass electrode this can also be measured. Now, the advantage you see you must realize that for example, in an industry if they have to monitor the penicillin concentration of their broth on an online basis any chemical measurement will take time let us say the report may take 2 hours, but whereas in the electrode uh, right the, uh, the plant operator has the electrode in his pocket and he takes a sample, dips it into, he knows when to, I mean the, the control becomes very easy. You can immediately take a decision uh, to either switch on or switch off or terminate whatever decision has to be taken on the plant and in those cases uh, such systems are very, very useful. Another analytical device based on immobilized enzymes is enzyme thermistor. Now, the enzyme thermistors are based on the measurement of temperature difference of the reaction liquid in an exothermic biochemical reaction. Now, mind it that here uh, uh, the situation is we are talking of exothermic biochemical reaction. So, many of the enzyme reactions which are highly isothermal, I mean I am I'm, I'm, I'm just comparing the two, I mean although they are known to be in all broad range as isothermal reactions, but uh, they will have some uh, value of delta H. So, those which have a slightly higher delta H value among enzyme reactions, they can be used for enzyme thermistor because they will induce a change in the temperature. Although, the te temperature change as you will notice is much smaller. Now, then involves the use of a semiconductor material showing a large resistance change with temperature. So, basically the measurement of temperature is based on the temperature, uh, the res change in resistance of a, a semiconductor material as a function of temperature and of course, we know for semiconductors the uh, expression which relates the resistance with reference to temperature T 1 and T 2 resistance changes and, and all those materials and semiconductors are known to have a high uh, I mean uh, change in resistance as a function of temperature and they are used here as the sensing device.
So basically a thermistor here thermistor is nothing else but a semiconductor material which is connected to a circuit which measures impedance and that can be used that if that is put at the tip of the I mean the effluent stream of the immobilizing jam reaction you can use it uh, for measurement of temperature. Now essentially in practice a well insulated immobilized enzyme column is used you take a very fine small column and insulate it insulate it and, and I think the, the, the most uh, difficult part of the enzyme thermistor is the very high order of insulation required because the temperature which we are range we are measuring is probably uh, a fraction of the integer you know in some time as low as 0 0.01 degree centigrade one hundredth of it centigrade there is a kind of temperature change we are talking about and so very high order of insulation and the eff effectiveness of this trans, uh, this uh, system depends on the uh, the insulation quality of insulation one can provide. Now the thermistor is mounted at the at the end of the fluid for example this is the immobilized enzyme uh, let us say material column and you feed the sample through a pump and uh, you have a, a small heat exchanger which maintains in a very uh, controlled range the inlet temperature and at the and, and the outlet temperature is monitored by a thermistor which is installed at the outlet end and is connected to a measurement circuit and measures the impedance. The delta T is indicated by the change in impedance and as I mentioned the range of and uh, I mean the temperature measurement for different enzymes lies in 0 0.004 to 1 degree centigrade and obviously higher this change is I think the system can be more effective. Usually it has been noted that only those enzymes which can generate a temperature change more than 0 0.1 degree centigrade are effect of course 0 0.004 is an academic exercise but uh, you need some measurable reliably measurable uh, I mean uh, amount of temperature change. Now the suitability of the enzyme thermistor depends on the enthalpy change associated with the biochemical reaction as we mentioned that we have the I mean if the more the exothermic reaction we are handling I think the system can be more effective and if you look into some values of delta H in the case of catalase it is 100.4 kilojoules and this is probably one of the highest delta H value in the case of enzymatic reactions and uh, this gives almost about uh, uh, a temperature change of 0.2 to 0.3 degree centigrade which, is, which can be very easily monitored. Glucose oxidase 80 kilojoules per mole, hexokinase 27.6 kilojoules per mole, lactate dehydrogenase another good uh, system 62.1 and urease with urea only 6.6. .6. As a matter of fact the urease uh, this system is usually not very effective and the first four ones are considered to be very effective and uh, of course the systems are not commercialized but in many laboratories they have been I mean tested used and reported. So what are we trying to do in the thermistor and what are we trying to monitor? The same the annihilate whatever substrate concentration we have uh, I mean the temperature change the change of temperature which is measured in terms of uh, change in resistance is related to the change of substrate concentration which is fed to the enzyme, enzyme sample. The delta H of reaction maps to substrate concentration. Pardon? The delta H of reaction is mapped to substrate concentration. How much of substrate is given? How much of heat? This is uh, per mole. Per mole of substrate consumed will I mean give the yeah. so much of heat quantity. Just like any exothermic reaction, you have a, I mean, uh, a delta H value. Then the uh, other uh, the, the third area of application of uh, enzymes analytical application I am referring to is structural analysis of bio macromolecule. We are you must have familiar when we do primary uh, structure determination of proteins usually we take a protein hydrolyze it by using some enzymes or chemical means by acid or alkali and monitor the different amino acids that are produced. Now the same job can be done by immobilized enzyme in a more controlled way and you can have controlled hydrolysis and monitor uh, the major advantage is uh, what we uh, the, the kind of problem that is faced in the case of a classical uh, analysis is the removal of the, uh, the hydrolyzing agent that is acid or alkali or in the insoluble enzyme. Now removal from the sample is a very tedious task and it also causes in some cases for example tryptophan. Now it is destroyed by alkali. 
So alkaline hydrolysis which is very commonly used for determination of primary structure does not measure tryptophan. But if you use uh, let us say a column of immobilized enzyme uh, for a controlled hydrolysis of a protein sample, first thing no amino acid will be destroyed. They will also even liberate the D amino acids if there are of course which are very again uh, very uncommon uh, occurrences in proteins. D amino acids, very uncommon occurrences in proteins, but they can also be analyzed. And therefore, you see the basic concept is that if we can we can analyze amino acid composition of proteins by using immobilized <coughs> proteases or base composition of nucleic acids if we use immobilized uh, uh, say phosphatases. If you take the phos I mean phosphoesterases and immobilize them, then you can have the base composition because the, the hydrolysis will yield and then you can have a very controlled hydrolysis and see the sequence. The major advantage in the e principle remains the same as in the case of soluble enzyme, but the preparation of the analytical samples becomes very easy because then you do not have to separate the hydrolyzing agent, the catalyst. You can simply either filter it off or centrifuge and your sample is ready for analysis. Then uh, and a major advantage again is in cases where sample contains amino acids that decompose by acid or alkali such as tryptophan and detection of D amino acids. In fact, in many cases uh, in the chemical analysis detection of D amino acid is difficult because it gets destroyed. I think I will skip another one before I come. Uh, the other uh, uh, analytical application sector was as a therapeutic agent. And now, which is, uh, uh, I mean, you will recall that with development in the availability of different enzymes and particularly the understanding of the molecular basis of diseases, the use of enzymes as therapeutic agents is by and large increasing. The conventional use of enzymes in therapeutics has been the use of proteases for a variety of situations that range from digestion aid to uh, even uh, treatment of certain uh, diseases uh, which involve the let us say the sub availability of one of the enzyme or removal of some metabolite, metabolite from the body. So, those cases the very large range of application sectors in the therapy have been known with soluble enzymes, but the use of soluble enzymes has certain very serious problems and the problems listed are here. One is that the enzyme has a higher molecular mass a very large molecule protein and impermeability through biological membranes. In fact, uh, the efficacy of any drug or a therapeutic agent depends on its permeability through biological membranes and even a chemical drug. I think its efficacy will depend if it can permeate through the biological membranes and reach to the site. So, basically the, the larger the molecule as the enzymes are, it poses a serious problem in the permeability and particularly you know uh, that the most toughest biological membrane through which the drug has to permeate is brain membranes. And as a matter of fact almost all drugs which are required to be given for uh, action at brain as a site, the concentrations are very high almost uh, 4 to 8 times more of that of the same drug if it is used at some other site in the body. Say for example, steroids if they have to be administered for some inflammation in some side leg or hand, you can give a very small dose and it will be it will reach to the site and treat the patient. But if the inflammation is in the brain, I think at least tenfold concentration of the drug is required to be administered because lesser than that it will not even permeate to the brain membrane and so giving it will be useless, it will go all over the body excepting brain. And that problem and essentially if you give the higher dose, you run into another problem of side effects because most of the drug there is no drug which is free of side effects. Any drug you take of course, you are taking it to cure a disease, but uh, slowly or I mean uh, you are also uh, getting exposed to certain side effects. So, therefore, uh, the high molecular mass which results into impermeability through the biological membranes is a major problem. Then I think another problem is instability to denaturation in biological fluids and proteolytic attack. Now, Ultimately, the drug has to reach into the biological fluids, say blood, or let us say if it has to reach to stomach. Now, the fluids have very strong conditions. For example, the, the fluid in the stomach will have a very low pH. There might be certain inhibitors present for the enzyme which might inactive which might reduce the rate of reaction, 
or there might be some proteolytic enzymes present and they can inactivate the enzyme protein. So those are the problems and in, and in fact any th a therapeutic device must take care of these problems if it has to be effective. That means I mean one should ensure that what is the site of action required, what is the biological I mean milieu there what is the I mean, chemical value there, what are the inhibitors present, what is the pH, what is the temperature and then only the enzyme function can be ensured. Then I think third is antigenic properties, hypersensitivity and immunological reactions. Now enzyme being a protein or rather a foreign protein to the body, the body is equipped through antibodies to generate uh, uh, immunological reactions and they can also be problematic and in fact the administration of any enzyme for therapeutic application must overcome these problems and of course a number of enzymes uh, a number of approaches have been I mean used to overcome these problems and some enzymes have become easily admissible. I would like to illustrate only one example uh, which has become quite interesting say for example in the case of patients who suffer from partial kidney failure that means uh, now kidney is probably one of the excellent example of a filtration system, highly specific filtration system in the body. No, I do not think that any other uh, uh, filtration device is available which is so specific and so lasting. And now, but in, still in some cases the failure, partial failure takes place and the kidney is not able to filter out or select or, re, or remove uh, let us say urea from the, so the urea concentration the blood stream increases and it can cause many metabolic problems and ultimately fatal, ultimately death. Now the conventional treatment for that, of course there are other therapeutic, I mean the chemical treatment, but at the last resort is to put on dialysis system. That means dialysis is something like an artificial organ, it is like an artificial kidney that you take out the blood from the uh, and put in a extracorporeal shunt which is where the your uh, uh, the liquid uh, passes this is a living body and the blood passes through the uh, a dialysis membrane a dialysis device in which the blood is dialyzed against a dialysate a buffer usually a buffer and now the quantity of buffer that has to be administered or that has to be passed in the conventional dialysis unit is 100 to 300 liters I mean this is the range of course in cases where the concentration of uh, urea uh, I mean the concentration of urea is much larger in the blood stream you may have to require more fluid to pass and because of this large volume required of dialysis usually a patient, patient has to be a, I mean sort of hospitalized and the whole setup of a hospital has to be used uh, for dialysis and obviously and the dialysis uh, the dialysate removes the metabolites urea in this case and the, so the urea level in the blood is brought down that is the conventional way. Now essentially as I mentioned that this system uh, uh, which is followed which has been followed in the past has lot of problems. One is that uh, the patient you know after some time fails to respond to dialysis if the concentration goes very high the volume of the dialysis required is very large, the frequency required is very high that means uh, initially you start let us say a dialysis once in a month he may end up daily dialysis and daily I mean sort of uh, putting him on dialysis in hospital is also a very difficult task because ultimately what you are doing you are circulating all of, all of the whole of his body blood through a dialysis system. It is a very tedious system to <coughs> look at and you are just putting a, a secondary uh, circulation system for blood which uh, already exists in the uh, body. The alternate to that is use of immobilized urease. And uh, this is an example of an artificial organ which is commercialized, which is available commercially and with such a system a patient does not have to go to hospital because the quantity, the volumes of the dialysate there required is only about a liter, <coughs> one liter which he can safely install in his uh, bed at the site of his bed in the house and use itself. The system uh, what it does is essentially uh, that the, the principle remains the same, you take blood in and Dialyzer unit is little compact, same dialysis bag, only thing is much smaller because as soon as the urea comes in the dialysate instead of being thrown out, it is passed through a uh, immobilized enzyme column usually I mean the, the one which is shown here is a micro capsule in which an annexing resin and the enzyme has been immobilized in micro capsules. So the urea present in the dialysate which comes out in the I mean the uh, dialysate 
is hydrolyzed to ammonia. Ammonia is absorbed by the ion exchange region. Of course, carbon dioxide is not allowed, is not bothered about because carbon dioxide, even if it reaches in the blood, the body has a capacity to, ex, I mean, a, a sort of exit out through lungs, assuming that the lungs are functioning properly of the patient. Uh, so, carbon dioxide can be left out, but ammonia cannot be sent back to the body, and ammonia is removed by ion exchange regions. And other metabolites which are generated, if any, in the, I mean, uh, in the sample, blood sample, they are taken care by activated carbon. And the same, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, sort of body fluid or the blood, uh, I mean, through a system is then sent back to the, I mean, uh, into the patient carbon. And such a system functions, and the advantage here is you notice. Uh, from the practical point of view, instead of a dilated volume using about of the order of 300 liters, we are talking of 1 or 2 liter of dilated. And because you are regenerating the dilated by removing the, glue, I mean, the, the, uh, urea, uh, the urea formed in the system and that kind of a system is uh, 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 commercially available now and of course, in the box uh, is an expanded view of the column in which the enzyme contains the enzyme, the immobilized micro capsules contain the enzyme and the ion exchange region. The reaction takes place urea gets into carbon dioxide and ammonia. Carbon dioxide is let off uh, in the blood stream for the body to take care and the uh, ammonia is taken care by the immobilized uh, the ion exchange beads and the size approximately of this uh, micro capsule is of the order of about 200 to 800 microns very fine micro capsule almost like a tiny cell and they are packed and this system is operable. So, what in fact uh, I just wanted to I mean uh, uh, conclude uh, the lecture was that besides industrial uh, besides the use of immobilized enzyme as industrial catalyst, the immobilized enzymes has a major role to play even for analytical devices and for therapeutic purposes. Now, I must stress again that at least these two applications have lesser implication as far as the economics is concerned. I think the issue of economics is very, very important in their use in the process industries. For therapeutic purposes, economics is secondary because the primary is the effectiveness of the system, the safety of the system. Analytical systems also because the quantity of enzyme required are so low that probably the economics uh, rather is always in favor because you save tremendously in the cost of labor. As I mentioned to you that uh, I have seen myself the analysis in at least in one of the hospitals in Sweden, uh, particularly I mean almost about 1000 samples in a day done by auto analyzer using immobilizing them and which essentially would have required at least 10 persons and you are aware that uh, the hiring of the person is the most uh, the last thing. I mean, a, I mean, at least in the Western world, they will try to replace any person with a machine that is cheaper, and the cost of analysis works out to be very cheap. Yeah. I mean, if you compare it with the hiring a person, and also more reliable, the human error is by and large, uh, I mean, avoided. So I will stop.